بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء أما بعد respected scholars, elders, brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله as we do have in accordance إن شاء الله to the Islamic calendar either two or three nights and it's more likely the three nights that we have left from the holy month of Ramadan and our time does come to a close. Inshallah we'd like to discuss something on a very personal level, a very emotional level in which we can relate to, break down Islam inshallah for the last three nights and see to ourselves by the time that Eid comes we have discussed in very brief aspect how is it that we can become good Muslims, how we can achieve that which we may find very hard to achieve. Is there a way we can simplify it down? You know, how to become, if we want to say, how to become the perfect Muslim or how to strive to become the perfect follower of the Ahlul Bayt. And inshallah tonight I want to look at one aspect which is of the utmost importance. And that's learning from your superiors, following in the footsteps, taking into granted that which we have, and realizing it after it's taken from us. And inshallah, I know I've touched up on a topic of role models and their importance, so I'm not going to talk about the importance of role models. I'm rather wanting to talk about tonight the importance of actually following in their footsteps. Because we can have role models in one aspect, and we discuss the importance of having such figures, having them as the beacon of guidance. However, that's one aspect is looking up to somebody and saying, wow, he has amazing characteristics. And there's another point in which we can learn from them. There's another point in which we apply what they say to our lives, apply what they teach to our lives in a daily perspective, live by what they teach us. Now the first perspective I want to look at, inshallah tonight, is in particular instances, especially in, within history, people that come forth and say the Quran is enough. That's the first, top, first dot point I want to look at for tonight. The second dot point, is I want to look at the aspect of what can assist the Qur'an in translation and the problems that arise. And on the third level, we'll want to look at examples from history, from people that thought they can narrate the Qur'an, thought that they can get jurisprudential, ethical, theological aspects from the Qur'an to apply to our lives in a wrong manner, and we want to look at how Ahlul Bayt alayhim afdal salati was salam can derive from the Qur'an. Into very simplified stories and inshallah we'll continue this in the aspect of how to achieve perfection inshallah in the, pre, in the upcoming night. So please assist me in starting tonight's topic by reciting Al-Aut Salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Now, as we know within history to derive a particular ruling or to, to deprive ourselves of the Qur'an is out of the question. Now, people come forth and state that the Qur'an is enough. Now, the reply is very simple because when we remember the calamity of Thursday, what did the second Khalifa say to the Prophet of Islam? On his deathbed when he said, and al-hawa, he does not talk of his own accord, he said, bring me what we know nowadays as a pen and a paper to write for you something that when I, when, if you stick to it, you will never go astray. He's talking about nowadays. The Qur'an, the person comes and says the Prophet is delirious. And we said we're going to go and read about it. The calamity of Thursday. He says the Prophet is delirious. It's enough for us, the book of Allah. It's enough for us, Allah's holy book, which is the Qur'an. Now let's take this into perspective. The Prophet wasallam says in numerous occasions... Numerous occasions, both within our books and every single other school of thought, they have these in one book or another. And it's narrated 
make sure you hold on to two things. And I want you to pay attention to this particular aspect because every single action, because we can look at the perfection of the wording of the prophets. There's perfection in it because nothing he says is from his own accord. It's from Allah and we know that for a fact. How about his actions? Because some people come forth and say, well, uh, the Prophet of Islam, he was only perfect in some aspects. In the other aspects, he, he was very fallible. As in, he was a normal human being. We defer, he says, the Prophet's infallible. Every single action, movement he did was perfection. And I want to give you an example, especially in context with what we're mentioning tonight. As we know, the Prophet has a narration in which he says, me and the person that takes care or sponsors an orphan, and he points with these two fingers. The middle finger and the index. He points to these two. Now look at these two fingers. One of them is larger than the other, isn't it? One has extra, one has less. However you want to look at it, one is larger than the other. Now the Prophet of Islam is not any man to say, me and the person that sponsors an orphan are like these two in heaven. Because obviously the Prophet has a higher rank. The person doesn't have the same rank as the Prophet because he's sponsoring orphan. He's his neighbor, yes. But the perfection is what? That they're not equal. They're together, but they're not equal. Now, now look at this perspective. When he mentions this hadith, he says, if you hold on to these two, you will never go astray after me. And you can't have one without the other. What does he say? He says, the Quran and my Ahlul Bayt, my Ahlul Bayt, my Ahlul Bayt. Now look at the perfection of his movements. He puts this exact same fingers on either side. On each one of his hands and he puts them together. What does that tell us? The Quran and the Ahlul Bayt are one. One is not excessive. One doesn't have more than the other. One doesn't have less than the other. Isn't that the perfection of the Prophet's movement? He's trying to tell you one is equivalent to the other. They will not be divided except on the day of judgment, on the pool of Kawthar, when everything has taken its place. Perfection. One translates the other. You can't have one without the other. We'll, we have examples now. So that's the first aspect. If we can only look at the Quran without the translation, without the performances of the Prophet known as the Sunnah of the Prophet, which means how he acted. The Sunnah, what does it mean? It doesn't, doesn't mean a sect in Islam. The Sunnah means how the Prophet carried himself, what he allowed, what he disallowed. His narrations, put it all into context, the way he acted. That's what sunnah actually means. People re refer to it as a particular school of thought in Islam. No. Tijani has a book. What does he write? He says the Shia are the true sunnah because they follow the Prophet the most. As we know, the people in the time of the first, second, third Khalif, when they prayed behind Ali ibn Abi Talib, what was the first thing they said? They said, we've never prayed like this ever since the Prophet passed away. What does that tell us? What, what does that tell us? The Prophet, Imam Ali alayhi salam comes into Kufa after the reign of the second Khalifa and the third Khalifa. He, it's his reign in Kufa. He says to the people that were praying what we call nowadays as taraweeh in congregation. He says it's mustahab. You're not allowed to pray it in congregation. You have to pray it individually. Imagine praying Salat al in congregation. Where's the merits in it? So Ali ibn Talib says you can't do this. The Prophet clearly says you can't do this. You have to pray this in a single manner. The people, what do they scream out? In Ali ibn Abi Talib's Khilafah, they say, Wa sunnat umara, which means what? Which means he had a totally different aspect. When Uthman is given the Khilafah, because after the first and second Khalifa, Uthman is given the Khilafah, and Ali ibn Talib had an opportunity. They said to Ali ibn Abi Talib, Do you take the Quran, the Sunnah of the Prophet, and the first and second Khalifa? He said, No. I only take the Quran and Sunnah of the Prophet of Islam. The first two, where did you bring them from? Where do I have to follow them in the Quran? They're not infallible. On the contrary, they went against the Prophet in many aspects. They've removed so many things that the Prophet put into perspective and put stuff that the Prophet made haram. They've changed the entire sunnah of the Prophet. Therefore, if I follow these three, it's in difference with one another. It contradicts one another. So Ali ibn Talib says, I won't have this. They take it to the other person. 
Uthman Affan, he says, without a shadow of doubt, give me the seat. I'll sit on it. Not a problem. If the Quran was enough and everyone knew the in-depth translations of the Quran and why it was revealed, when it was revealed and what it was revealed about, we wouldn't need translation. We wouldn't have 73 sects nowadays. One saying that the other is an infidel. Would we? If the Quran was enough, we'd be united on everything. We'd be united on the translation. We all have the same Quran. Can anyone come forth and say one harakah is in its wrong position? A fatha or a kasra? We can't say that. Because the Quran is perfect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says we have brought down this Quran and we protect it. The Quran is perfect. Where does the differences lie? In its translation. If the second Khalifa was correct to tell, tell the Prophet that the Quran is enough for us, we wouldn't have these many sects. That's the first aspect. The second aspect, how have people taken it out of context? I'll give you an example. There was a Khalifa, I believe this is attributed to Al-Hajjaj. Now look at this and look at how they take it out of context. Hajjaj, one day he made a ruling on a particular person. Hajjaj, he said that this particular person was a hukum shara. I can't remember exactly what the hukum was for, but the punishment was 80 lashes. 80 lashes. So the person is being lashed. The hukum's there. They had the person that was whipping him. 80 lashes. He's whipping and whipping. And the person, he's in a weakened state. All he has is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What did we say? If you have no one, you go towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The person, what is he saying? As he's being whipped for his sin, he's saying, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. So the person that's whipping, he looks at the Khalifa, he says, should I stop? He says, no, no, keep going, keep going. He says, but you've only told me 80. He says, no, keep going, trust me. Wa alaykum as salam, rahmatullah. He says, keep going. So he kept going. The person saying, hold on, you said 80. I've been whipped a lot more than 80. What's going on? He said, you're saying Alhamdulillah, aren't you? He says, yes. He says, Allah says in the Quran, if you thank me, la azidannakum. It says, Allah in the Quran says, if you thank me, I will increase you. I will give you more. And the person's thinking to himself, hold on, that's totally out of context. How does it even apply to me? I'm going to eat another extra 10 or 20 whips because you can't translate a verse in question properly and use it as you wish. So we find people in history that take it out of context. As an example, as a hajjaj, whips me extra 20 because he wants to translate it in a particular aspect. Our 10th Imam, there was an aspect that happened in the, in the Khalifa's time, the Abbas Khalifa's time, in which they had to cut off someone's hand because he's stolen something. They couldn't understand, they couldn't comprehend where to cut his hand. Some people said, we have to cut it from here. Some say, say I had to cut it from the hand. Some say they had to cut his fingers. So people, you know, started to have their own opinions. And in the, in the Khalifa's culture, he's thinking to himself, well, if there's only one Quran, how, why do you have so many different opinions? Why do you have so many different opinions? So his right-hand man looks at him. He says, you know that we have the son of the, or the grandson of the Prophet of Islam in isolation. And you know that's the only one that can actually give us the correct hukum. He says, yes. He says, go to him. Sends a messenger, he comes back. He, he quotes a, a verse from the Holy Quran in which, in which he says, the mosques are for Allah. And he translates it in a way that says, this is the thing that you put down. You need something to put down when you're in sujood. And he says, you have to keep his palms. If you want, cut his fingers off. Takes it, uh, takes it in a beautiful manner. In another narration, the same imam, at the time, he said, if I, in a particular nidr nowadays, if we have nidr, we say to ourselves, if we do such and such, I will do such and such. As an example, if Allah, for example, allows me to finish my studies, I will pray a hundred rakat, for example, or I'll give this much charity. That's a nidr between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this khalifa says, if this particular aspect happens, I will give from my wealth, kathir is the word that he used. I will give, wa anfaq malan kathir, kathira. So the people, again, in the courtroom, he brings all the scholars. He says, what's... Kathir, get me from the Quran. What's Kathir mean? How much do I have to give? Thousand, two thousand, what do I have to give in dinars? What's, what's Kathir in the Quran? Get me a jurisprudential 
ruling, how much is it that I have to give? So everyone begins to throw answers, left, right, and center. And the person's thinking, what's going on? Everyone's wearing a turban in front of us. What's, you can't come to one conclusion? So his right-hand man again tells him, he goes, you know that we've only put the turbans on these people so that we can take people away from the school of thought of Ahlul Bayt. He goes, they didn't actually know anything. You're not actually going to listen to them. So he goes, send the messenger. Sends the messenger to the imam. Comes back the messenger. He goes, you have to give 82 or 83 dinar. He says, why? He says, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells his prophet that we, in the Quran he says, he says, we have made you victorious in many places. Mawatana kathira. And he says, if you count in history how many places that the Prophet was victorious in battle, it comes to 82 or 83 times. I can't remember exactly right now. But the narration states, and the gist of the narration is what? Is that the, prof is that the Imams can grab something that we don't look at and put it into perspective. Three nights ago or four nights ago, we mentioned Ali ibn Abi Talib, in which the mothers came towards Ali ibn Abi Talib and says, the son's ours. What did Ali ibn Abi Talib do? He got the breast milk from both mothers and he weighed it. And he says, the one that's twice as heavy, that's the one that the boy belongs to. They say, why? He says, from the Quran is derived. He says, where is in the Quran? What did we mention? Two females have the right of one, or the inheritance of one. is like that of two females. He says, therefore, I have derived as Ali ibn Abi Talib that the milk weighs twice as much. Now we just look at, for our perspective, can we get that particular narration from this? Where can we get that narration? So therefore we can analyze and dictate to our souls that the Quran without the true translators of the Quran is down to interpretation. Therefore that's why we have the translations and the ahadith of the Prophet of Islam and his holy progeny. Ali ibn Abi Talib, what does he have a statement? He says, there is not one verse in the holy Quran that has been revealed to the Prophet of Islam except that I know where it was revealed, when it was revealed and what it was revealed about. Then he goes on to say, Saluni qabla an tafqiduni. Why? Because it was Ali ibn Abi Talib. The person that opened his eyes in the eyes of the Prophet of Islam. Do you think he has the translation of the Quran or someone that didn't even see the Prophet? This is the family of the Prophet, the place in where Jibra'il used to bring down the revelation. That's why we have to look into perspectives when we have the Holy Quran and it's the book of blessing, the miracle of the Prophet of Islam. We have to look at the people that translate it and the arbitration between Muawiyah and Ali ibn Abi Talib and Safin. What happens? Muawiyah puts the Qur'ans on the spies to trouble the Muslims, to, to make the Muslims divide within themselves, to pretend that they're the people of the book. Ali ibn Abi Talib, what does he say? He says, attack those people. They've taken the word of God in a wrong manner. He says, I am the Qur'an that is speaking. He says, I am the manifestation of the Qur'an. He says, the Qur'an is a perfect book nonetheless, but we, we, we don't comprehend it. We need people to translate it for us that have the knowledge of the Qur'an, that are on the same level in accordance with the Prophet of Islam. He says, hold on to the book of Allah and my Ahlul Bayt, my Ahlul Bayt, my Ahlul Bayt. There's a deeper significance. And there's so much to say on this particular topic, but I want to just put it in the light of the perspective. And inshallah, tomorrow we want to continue with how simple Islam can be. How simplified Islam can be. That to ourselves, in theory, it's so simple. If we say to, to ourselves that, you know what, if we pray five times a day, five, three times a day, five prayers, on time, Imam Mahdi, Ajallah Ta'ala Farajah Sharif will look at us will consider us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he calls us, let's be there on time. Theoretically, it's perfect, it's sound, it's easy. Come into practice. Come into practice. I talk on myself first and foremost. I say, how many, how many days have gone past, or when was the last time that I prayed every single prayer on time? When was the last time? Within the time span, within the first 15 to 20 to 30 minutes, I can't question myself. I can't remember the last time I was perfectly on time. Imam Mahdi, a person wasn't even religious 
But he knew he had the characteristics to pray on time. When he made the nidr to the imam, the imam quickly answered it. He knew in himself that that person had those qualities. When we look at the people that the imam visits, and it's another level we'll talk about tomorrow. We look at the characteristics of these people. Simple people. Not the most religious. Not the most knowledgeable. But they practice that which our imams preached. On a very, very, very delicate level. Very delicate level. And inshallah, I end on that note. But inshallah, we want to take into context the topic for tomorrow night, which will be very, very important, which is how to humble ourselves. Tomorrow, we want to look at how to simplify Islam, how to look at it at a very, very simple level in our actions, not going into the depth of knowledge or understanding, but our actions in a humane level, in a human level. The sad thing is, there's a scholar that went towards France in the West. Take this as the last comment for tonight. And inshallah, we'll continue from this comment tomorrow night. He says, I went to the West. I went to the West. You saw, I saw Islam. The way people treated each other. The systems that were in play. The, the respect one had for one another. He says, the way people treat one another, human level. He says, I saw Islam. However, I did not see any Muslims. No one was called Muslim, but I saw Islam. In practice, I saw it. He says, when I went back to my country, which was inhabited by Muslims, I didn't see Islam. I didn't see Islam being practiced, the moral values, the ethical principles, the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us to live within one another. He said, I didn't see those principles. I saw it in the West. He says, in the Middle East, I didn't see it. Let's put it into question. How is it that we can be Muslims and practice Islam? And inshallah, we'll get into that tomorrow night. But I pray to, tonight on the final level, and I allow the chance for the Sheikh to enlighten us with his wisdom, on the final level that we need to understand. And we pray to Allah that he increases us in the understanding of how to follow in the footsteps of our Imams. How to follow in the footsteps of the Ahlul Bayt. How to listen to something that they've done and apply it to our lives. That's the perspective that we have to learn from Ramadan before it escapes from us. And we pray to Allah on that note. The Surah al mubarakah Al-Fatiha, but before three of you, loud the salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.